few months ago, a couple months ago, we were at dinner at Dennis and Sarah's, Dana's parents' house. And Sarah was very excited because she had found a sign that she had been looking for. It said, thankful, grateful, and blessed. She had been looking for this for a while, and so we go over. She had it. She was showing us. She had hung it on the wall. I don't know that she hung it on the wall. It was higher than four feet, so I'm guessing, <laughs> I'm guessing Dennis hung it. Amen. There, there we go. Grateful, thankful, and blessed. Or was it thankful, grateful, and blessed? See, I can't keep track. Um, but as we were leaving, or when we had left, we were in the car on the way home, and I asked Dana, I said, so I've got to ask, what's the difference between thankful and grateful? Like that, to me, seemed like a waste of paint. Redundant. Can't we just say, can't we consolidate and say grateful and blessed? It's almost like she's married to a pastor. <laughs> Too many words, right? Um, uh, what's the difference? And, and, and Dana, Dana said, just don't say anything. <laughs> and I'm sure she was thinking, and for the love of everything holy, please don't use it as a sermon illustration. <laughs> but she never expressly said that, so... So here we are. Um, but we Googled it, right? Uh, Googled it. There is a distinct difference between thankful and grateful. I don't know if you knew that. Some of you are like, I knew that. You're liars. You didn't know that. You've got the sign at home. You're trying to justify it. Um, but there is a distinct difference. Thankful, apparently, is what you feel. Grateful is what you do with what you feel. So grateful is an action Thankful is a feeling. So if you're thankful, you should be grateful. Right? You see how that works? I never knew that. So it turns out my mother-in-law was right. And that just stinks. <laughs> but but, but the, there's, there's this profound difference between what we feel sometimes and what we do. We live in a culture that feels a lot and makes that a truth. We, we make our feelings a truth. We've adopted kind of a therapeutic language. You know, the, the I feel language is what happens in a counseling office. So let's say my wife and I go in for marital counseling. She needs it. Um, <laughs> And we were sitting there, and she were to make the comment you know, to me, well, you always leave your socks at the bottom of the chair when you peel them off and kick back for the night. You always leave your socks there. And the, the, my brain, that's always looking for a loophole, would go, well, not always. Not always, because there are times when I just sit down and I don't even take my shoes or socks off. So it can't be always. So what, they, what the, the counselor or therapist will tell you to do, they'll say, well, use I feel words because you can't invalidate I feel words. So Dana then would say, well, I feel like you're always leaving your socks on the floor. And, and I can say, well, I'm not always, but I understand that that's how you feel. Isn't it amazing? We've made this, our feelings, we've, made, we've turned it almost into truth itself. It's part of the reason we're in the mess that we're in. We feel one way, and our actions flow out of that. So here's what I want you to know. Your actions, if thankfulness is a feeling, gratefulness, gratitude is an action, your actions betray your feelings. Not that, they, not that they betray them in the way like they're counter to it, although sometimes that happens, but they evidence what is really going on on the inside. It's this idea of fruit and root. If you want fruit from a tree, you don't deal with fruit on the end of the branch. You deal with root of the tree. Uh, the fruit is the evidence of what the root and the rest of the tree is doing. This is the way gratitude works as well. Or any action. Let's just call it feeling and action. Feeling and action. They work hand in hand. And the action betrays what you really feel or even what you really believe. For instance, I can say, I can confess that I believe in Christ. Christ the King Sunday. I can confess that. 
But if my actions don't line up with my confession, my actions actually demonstrate that I believe something different. I've met a lot of people who believe in Jesus, but their actions do not demonstrate that. Um, I heard this on a program the other night. I have no idea if it's true or not. It seems to be true. Let me rephrase that. It feels like it's true. <laughs> okay, so here's, how, here's what I heard. It was on, it was on a program. Um, and, and what they were saying was that every year, every year more pictures are taken in one year than in all of the previous years combined. Think about that. And you think about the number of pictures that are taken now with cell phones and everything, that every year the quantity is growing so exponentially that it pales the previous year and the previous year before that and the previous year before that all added up together. Now, this, this show was a couple of years old. I don't know if we've hit a, a status quo yet on that, uh, but it seems true. But here was the other thing that, that they, they said. They said 70% of those pictures are selfies. 70%. What goes on on the outside betrays what's really going on on the inside. Christ is my king, so we take pictures of ourselves. You see how this works? Our actions and our feelings go together, but sometimes what we say we feel or believe is not what our actions do. Okay, so we've been talking about confessing Christ. And today, actually, we conclude this series. And the title today for the sermon, every week I've added a title to it, the title today is just simply Confessing Christ. It's been the series title, but for us, it's also the culmination of what all of this is about. If this is Christ the King Sunday, and if we're going to express thankfulness and gratitude as is apropos for the season, then we've got to uh, recognize that, that the God that we serve should be the God that we serve in all parts of our life. The God that we say we believe in is the God that informs every part of our life. I, I, I have this theory. You've heard it uh, these last few weeks. I don't think this issue of confessing Christ is an evangelistic methodology, a way of winning people to Christ. I think this idea of confessing Christ is a consistency in our life that in all that we do, all that we do with our hands, we reflect the nature of what Christ has done on the inside. And it transforms our life, and it transforms our families, and it transforms our world. Confessing Christ. It's not something we do, it's something we are. Amen. It's our actions, it's everything. And so it's more than just a feeling. More than a feeling. Uh, sorry. Um, it's, more, it's more than just a feeling. It's, it's something that becomes so endemic to our life that it's almost like we can't Help it. I love that verse in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where Jesus says, um, when the Spirit comes, that you will be my witnesses. You remember that? Judea, Samaria. Um, and so we're like, well, so what does that mean? We need to go out and witness. Well, yes, I'm not throwing all of that out. This isn't about throwing out the baby with the bathwater. But what this means is actually um, the Spirit of God will come upon you and you will be in the sense that you almost can't not be. <laughs> right? If I plant a tree in my, in my garden or in my yard and, and it grows to maturity, um, I can say you will bear fruit, not because it ha the tree has to sit there and think about what does it take to bear fruit? I've got to bear fruit, got to bear fruit, got to bear fruit, got to bear fruit. No, it's a tree. It does, and what, what a healthy tree does is it bears fruit. Fruit. And this is the idea in Matthew 28, 19. You will be, not you will learn how to be, you will just simply be. So the issue with confessing Christ is not let's figure out another methodology, not that all methodologies are bad, but let's figure out what it means to live fully transformed lives and confess Christ. You see, feelings, beliefs, and actions go together. 
Um, and, and our actions do betray our belief. What you do is what you believe. So I want to end this series in kind of a courtroom, Mark chapter 14. Now, if you recall, many weeks ago when we started this series, we started in Mark chapter 8. Seems like an odd place to start. But if you recall, Jesus had taken his disciples just outside of the city of Caesarea Philippi, and they were looking over the city, and he asked them a question. He said, who do people say that I am? And they, they responded in chorus, well, some say you're Elijah, others say you're John the Baptist, still others say you're one of the prophets. And there, there was a consistency in their message. They're saying just like um, Elijah was a prophet and John the Baptist, kind of the last of the old line of prophets, um, in the same way, you're a prophet. That's what the answer, uh, people are just saying you're a prophet. It's kind of the answer they were given. And so then Jesus turns around and he says to them, so who do you say that I am? Right? Not who do people say. Who do you say? Peter's answer, do you remember? You are the Christ. Christ is the Hebrew word, or is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah, Mashiach, um, which is the, uh, the, the English translation nearest equivalent for us would be king. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus responds to Peter. The man has not revealed this to you. It was revealed to you by God. And he says, and you are Petros, you are Peter. It's kind of a nickname. It's, it's more of a dog's name or a boxer's name. It's more like Rocky, Petros. You are Petros, and upon this rock, this Petras, upon this rock I will build my church, not upon the man himself, but upon that confession that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So this was the answer. Who'd, who do people say that I am? Peter gave this answer. You are the Christ. Now, the reason I want to conclude this series in Mark 14 is because we hear this phrase again. You are the Christ. But our translations, and I looked at all of them, Miss it. Miss it. So I want to read it the way it reads in the Greek. I'm not going to read it in Greek. That would be bad for all of us. I'm hooked on Greek phonics. That's, I'm, I'm slow and clumsy. Um, but here's what's happened. Uh, Mark chapter 14, Jesus has now been arrested. And he's been brought before a kangaroo court. Um, there, he's been arrested late in the night. Uh, the mob came. The mob arrested him. And they're, they're going to parade him from place to place, from house to palace. And, and so he's going to stand before the Sanhedrin with the high priest, the Jewish ruling body. And then he's going to go to Pilate and Herod and then back to Pilate. And they're going to parade him around. They weren't supposed to be doing any of this in the middle of the night. They had laws. It was a kangaroo court. Um, but the idea was that they needed, to, uh, they needed to get everybody on the same page, everybody in agreement. And so they were going to parade him around. And one of his first stops is at the house of the high priest. Um, and, and, and so now here is Jesus, and he's brought before the high priest. Um, there's a couple of names given in Scripture. One is the patriarch of the family, Caiaphas, um, who had been high priest, but now one of his sons or son-in-law was high priest Annas. And uh, as you're reading, it is pronounced Annas. I just thought I'd help you with some of your reading. Um, and so, so here they are, they're in this house, and, and the Jewish Sanhedrin is there, and they're not allowed to execute anybody. That has to happen by Rome, but they are allowed to pass some judgments. And so they bring Jesus before the Sanhedrin and the high priest, and, and, and a question is asked. Jesus is asked actually several questions, um, and he remains silent for most of them. But in a rare instance, Jesus is asked a question and actually given a, 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 he actually gives a direct answer. That usually doesn't happen. Usually Jesus answers a question with a question or answers a question with a parable. 
And sometimes you get frustrated and you're like, oh, I just wish you'd say uh, what you want us to hear. And in this instance, he does. And it's a rare occurrence. So I want to read it beginning with verse uh, 61. It says, but Jesus remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Now, here's where your translations have failed you. Because what you see here in the English is not what is in the Greek. You remember Mark 8? Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ. Now, in the Greek, it's, it's see ho, uh, let's see, see, see I ho, uh, I can't remember, see I ho Christos, something like that. In the Greek, it, it's, it's the same phrase, but now it's got a question mark at the end of it. It's an exclamation with a question. You are the Christ? See, Peter says, you are the Christ. Uh, but now here's the high priest, and he says, you are the Christ? It's not an accident. Mark, the gospel writer, wants us to draw a parallel here. We, we've missed it because our translations haven't helped us in this, uh, but there's two things going on, and it's this idea that, that what we believe on the inside actually has ramifications for what we do on the outside. You are the Christ is how it should read, verse 61. You are the Christ, the son of the blessed. He won't say the name of God. He's pious. Verse 62, and Jesus said, I am. <laughs> like, you're used to Jesus not giving a straight answer. And he just says, I am. And then he says, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. That's an allusion to Daniel chapter 7. And we're not going to get into all of that today. We covered a lot of that on our Wednesday study some weeks ago. Um, but today I want to focus on this issue of you are the Christ as a statement and you are the Christ as a question. And the story that we see, everything in between, because it functions like bookends and, and it deals specifically with what we believe, what we think, what we feel, and how we respond to it. So here's what's astounding in this. Picture the irony, if you can. Remember, it was Peter who makes the declaration, you are the Christ. Peter said a lot of bold things in, his minist in, in Jesus' ministry. But then that Peter, who made the statement, you are the Christ, while Jesus is standing in, being grilled by the high priest and by the Sanhedrin, Peter is in the courtyard outside. And guess what he's doing? Denying Christ. You see the irony here? The same Peter who said, you are the Christ, is at that moment outside three times saying, I don't know the man. Wow. Three times. Uh, he, the first time uh, they said, someone said, I think I saw you with him. Peter says, I've never been with the man a day in my life. The next time uh, someone says, no, I, you were definitely there. And he's like, I'm telling you, I, I don't even know him. I've never seen him. The third time it was a servant girl who says, no, you speak with a Galilean accent. Right? That's like being from Texas. <laughs> right? You speak with a Galilean accent. And, and, and so we can tell you're from the region, and I'm pretty sure. And, and he calls down curses upon himself and profanely says, I tell you, I was not with the man. This is Peter. You are the Christ. But his actions said, no, you're not. And now there's a question. While this is happening, there's a question happening on the inside. They are, they are just yards apart from each other. Uh, you know, they are so close that in one of the Gospels, when Peter denies Jesus, on, and the third time, if you know the story, the rooster crowed, and, and Jesus had told Peter that he would deny him three times before the rooster crowed, and so now the rooster crowed, it's probably about three in the morning at this point, and they are so close that when, uh, when Peter betrayed Jesus the third time and the rooster crowed, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. 
And Peter fled, weeping. Can you imagine? He recognized, you are the Christ. I don't know the man. Okay, there's parallels for our life there, isn't there? (laughs) Sometimes we say very bold things in the name of Christ. And then Monday comes around. (laughs) Or Tuesday or Wednesday. Or Sunday afternoon, we often drive to Dennis and Sarah's house on Sunday afternoons, evenings for dinner together as a family. And I've got to tell you, we have church every Sunday morning after because I think on that drive I lose my salvation about once a week. <laughs> right? I'm tired I'm, I, and, and people are stupid. They're just everywhere. Stupid people are everywhere. <laughs> And, uh, and, and I, I, like, I can stand up here and boldly make statements about my beliefs and my actions and how our lives should be consistent, and then I start my car up and I get on the interstate and it seems like all of that goes away. Like I deny Christ like I've never known him. Yeah, but that person was not merging correctly. You don't slow down to merge. <laughs> you speed up, Right? I'm looking over here, and they're stopping. No, right? But Jesus, didn't you see? They're stupid. (laughs) Jesus is like, yeah, I died for stupid people, even you. (laughs) Right? That's how it works. Sometimes we find ourselves, like Peter, around the fire pit, denying we ever knew him with our actions. The difference between being thankful and grateful. And sometimes we find ourselves grilling Jesus with the proclamation becoming a question. Are you the Christ? Prove yourself to me. Jesus once said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks signs. We are waiting sometimes for the signs of Christ, and Christ is waiting for the church to evidence those signs. Are you the Christ? Prove yourself to me. Jesus says, I have nothing to prove. So here we are. Gratefulness, thankfulness, feelings, beliefs, actions, they all go together in this this mess of our lives. And so I want to look at this idea, if gratefulness is action, is actionable in our life, then out of this story, out of this series, not just this Sunday, but out of these weeks, what does gratefulness mean? look like? What does the action of faith look like? Here's the first thing. Gratefulness is the action of receiving what Christ gives. You've got to get it to have it. Believing in Christ is not the same as receiving Christ. Um, uh, believing in Christ is not the same as receiving what Christ has freely given. It's not the same. A lot of people believe. A lot of people don't believe. Even the demons of hell believe, Jesus said, and it terrifies them. Right? Belief is, by itself, is not what saves you. I know the, the Bible verses, if you, had, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Christ, you will be saved. And that's, that's true. But, but understand, this is belief that generates action. It generates transformation. Simply saying, I believe, is not the same as, sim- as saying, I am saved. We, we must receive the gift. We've started Christmas shopping in our house. And we have presents stashed in various locations. I like hiding them in plain sight so that they've looked at them all along without knowing they were looking at them. Um, uh, but, uh, but if I wrap those presents up and I place them under the tree, my kids, this won't happen. This is, I know this won't happen. My kids can look at the gifts and go, oh, thank you, mom and dad, I'm so thankful. But if they never open the silly gift... It means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. They can believe in the gift, whatever that means. They can see the gift. They can prove the gift. But if they don't receive the gift, there's nothing. This is part of the first actionable thing of the gratefulness. The action of faithfulness is actually receiving what Christ gives. I pray you understand that because... Because I, I'm like some of you, I live in my head. 
and I'd like to think my way into faith. But sometimes faith needs more than just thinking your way into it. Sometimes it means stepping out and receiving what has been offered. It is of no value to say that we believe in Jesus if we do not receive the gift of salvation. Whether we are like Peter on the outside or like the priest on the inside, our belief is evidenced in either receiving what he offers or rejecting it. I cannot say I'm grateful for what Christ gives if I refuse to accept it. So what does this mean? Well, in theological terms, we call this salvation. Being saved. I'll be honest with you, as I mature in Christ, I'm not sure what being saved means. Isn't that weird? Like, I should have that one figured out. That's like, that's like um, number one thing, how to be saved. I know I am saved, or even what it means to be saved, but I'm finding the salvation that I have in Christ is always, is always transforming in my life into something new. It's a bigger salvation than a moment that happened over two decades ago. It's, it's so much bigger. So I'm not quite sure anymore what it means to be saved, except I know when, when someone's not got it. <laughs> and I know when I've not got it or had it. And, I, and to be honest, the whole world knew when I didn't have it. Um, some of you still wonder. Right? But this is the idea. Uh, gratefulness in the, the action of gratefulness in receiving Christ is salvation. Just receive the gift. Okay, do I need to pray a prayer? That's fine. You can pray a prayer. The prayer is not what saves you. It's Jesus. Do I need to, a sinner's hand, a prayer? Do I need to raise a hand? Great. That's fine. All of that's fine. No problems. But don't rest in a raised hand or a prayed prayer. Rest in the saving grace of Christ. The transforming grace of Christ. So gratefulness is the action of receiving what Christ gives. Here's the second thing. Gratefulness is the action of surrendering what we've been for what we are becoming. This is why I love the story of Peter. When was Peter's moment? When was Peter saved? When Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men? Maybe. Um, but man, he had a rough story, didn't he? When was Peter saved? I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure. Maybe it was at Caesarea Philippi when he finally confessed, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I'm not sure. When was Peter saved? He never prayed a prayer. He never raised his hand. As far as I can tell, he didn't go to an altar. When was he saved? Here's why I love the story of Peter. Because in Peter's story, as in everybody's story, we see this lifetime of transformation. And I love that transformation, continual ongoing transformation. It's not just that I've stopped being what I've been, it's that I start being what I am becoming. You know, there's, a point, there's never a point in our life where we arrive there. We don't, we don't go, okay, well now, now I'm saved, now I'm sanctified, uh, I don't need to do anything else. No. We're always becoming more than we have been. The old is always dying. The new is always being born in us. And this is what gratefulness, gratefulness is the action of surrendering what we've been for what we are becoming. This is what it means to confess Christ. It means that we are surrendering our old way of doing things for a new way of being entirely. The old man, the King James used to call it, um, uh, the old nature, whatever it is, the old Adam, this old way of being is daily crucified and a new way of being is daily born in our life. In theological terms, we call that sanctification. And, and it's, it's not something that you need to get, it's something that you get and you're always getting. It's not something that you are, it's something that you've been called to. I remember the first uh, growing up having heard these messages of sanctification and I remember the frustration of saying, why can't I get it? Like I wanted the, the lapel pin, sanctified, right? Why can't I get it? I prayed. Why can't I get it? Honestly, it was because the way I had heard it taught or, and I don't know if it was the way it was taught or the way that I heard it, but what I, what I thought was sanctification was this moment 
that solved all my problems. Like I'll never struggle with things again. I'll never be tempted to deny Christ again. I'll never be tempted to watch the program I shouldn't watch. I'll never be tempted to do that stuff again. That's what I thought sanctification was. And I knew the mess of my life. And it seemed like I was never going to get anything because I wasn't getting anywhere. And that frustration led me to a desperation. And it was almost like in a moment God revealed, you surrender all of that now but there's going to be more to surrender along the way. And I'm going to walk with you every step of the way. It's always what we are becoming. What we are becoming, this sanctification. This is what gratefulness is. It's the action of surrendering what we've been for what we are becoming. It always makes you think when you've gone to a funeral. What will they say about me? You ever thought that, asked that question? Yep. I've said before, some of you I'm going to bury, you'd think you'd be nicer. <laughs> what are they going to say about, what are they going to say about me? What are they going to say? And we had fun yesterday, but at the same time, we experienced grief. You guys know how that works. But at the end of it, are they going to say, well, they stopped growing when they got sanctified? Can you imagine who you're going to be on the day that you die? It's not the person you are now. But your life is moving towards that, towards that glorification of what Christ is making you be. And the idea of sanctification is that what is future, what, what, what God has planned for you in the future is by the Spirit brought in, in degrees and stages and moments and crises is brought into my life right now. It's God bringing the future into the present. What I'm becoming becomes part of who I am right now. I don't have to wait to become. I can start becoming right now. What a glory this is. What freedom this is. Um, so gratefulness is the action of receiving what Christ gives. Gratefulness is the action of surrendering what we've been for what we are becoming. And then finally this, great, gratefulness is the action of participating in what Christ is doing. Here's what's amazing to me. What we call salvation stories throughout the New Testament and the Old always come with an invitation to do something. Think of Saul on the road to Damascus. We call that his conversion. I don't know that that's the right word. Do you remember the conversation? He sees a bright light and, uh, and, and he hears a voice, Lord, Lord, why are you persecuting? Or he hears the, 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 uh, the voice that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now rise and go for I am sending you to the Gentiles. And I will show you what it means to suffer in my name. Saul got up. He was blind. He went into Damascus. Three days later, he received his sight. Starts a riot instantly. Is driven out of town, disappears for 10 years. That's a whole other story of Paul needing to grow up. right? But, but here's the thing. When was Saul saved? Notice. I don't know if it was so much a salvation as it was a commission. Rise, go, I'm sending you. Part of our salvation and sanctification is to recognize that God is sending us. We don't rest in our salvation with nothing to do. We rise in our salvation with a world, uh, the word of God to proclaim. This is what it means to confess Christ. We become participants of what Christ is doing on earth. The kingdom model that Christ is bringing, the idea of the future reality of Christ's kingdom coming into the world has been given to the church. I don't know about you, but some days I think, God, you should have had a better plan. Because too many of us, too many preachers like me, too many Jeffs are out around the fire pit warming themselves, denying Christ all too often. 
God, don't, you should have had a better plan than this. And he says, no, no, because I'm going to invest in you this so that you have this purpose, you have a reason. And it's so much bigger than what you can handle. But, but that's why it takes all of us. You see, it's full participation in what God is doing. The point of receiving the gift is so that we can participate in the work. God has chosen to bring his kingdom to earth by partnering with his creation, with us. And what he offers as a free gift also comes as a full participation in what he is doing. So here's the question today. Are you just thankful? Or are you grateful? What is your life evidence? What is the fruit of your life? Where's the action? And let me give you these points. It's, it's simply, never easily, but simply receive, surrender, participate. Receive, surrender, participate. This is the hope that we have. As we enter into this Thanksgiving season... It seems, it seems appropriate that we would hear this message because we have been given so much, so much. And we say we're thankful for all that God has blessed us with, but here's the question for you today. Are you grateful for what God has blessed you with? Because if you answer that question, you will prove the transformation of Christ in your heart and your life. 